this thing turned on here. We're going to go back there. All right. You got your Bible? Turn with me to uh, Romans chapter number 12. Romans chapter number 12. Uh, very familiar uh, passage of Scripture to us this evening. So please don't let familiarity uh, rob us of what the Word of God has to say to us. Um, I believe that the Word of God is still applicable today. One man said that the Word of God is as up to date as tomorrow morning's newspaper. And even though you and I have heard sermon after sermon preached out of this text, and uh, you've heard preachers far better than me uh, deal with these verses, I want to try to be a help to you. Uh, but before we get started, I want to tell the church, thank you, thank you, Brother uh, Danny and the church for your hospitality, Brother our sister Julie for allowing us to invade your house while we're here. Uh, we appreciate your kindness, and I'm glad to see some familiar faces. I'm glad to see some new faces. I've got some good news for some of you. You look a little better. And then in, in some of your cases, I'm so sorry you don't look any better than the last time we were here. Just make sure you all are smiling. It's good to laugh in the house of God, all right? It's good to smile from time to time. All right, Romans chapter number 12 this morning or this evening. Uh, we'll read just two verses and you can be seated. Verse number one, the scripture says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You can be seated. Father, thank you, Lord, for this day, your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for the Word of God and the truth contained in it. Father, thank you for allowing us to gather together this evening. And as we deal with the Word of God, I pray that you'd help me. Lord, forgive me where I fail you. Forgive me of sin. Fill me with your spirit. Lord, use me as a mouthpiece. Lord, speak through me as only you can. Father, I pray that you would guard my mind, my tongue, and my lips. Lord, that I'd say everything that I should and nothing that I should not. Father, I ask you, Lord, that uh, you give every one of us a receptive heart and ears to hear the word of God tonight. Challenge us, convict us, and conform us into your image. And we'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen. This evening, I want to deal with the thought, a normal Christian life. A normal Christian life. If you're familiar with the book of Romans, you know that the theme of this great book is the gospel and its effect upon men. From chapter number 1 through chapter number 11, Paul details for us some of the greatest truths uh, revealed in all of the Word of God. He starts it out in chapter 1 verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek and he picks up from there and he heads full steam into why men must be saved in chapter 2 and chapter 3 he details for us very clearly how wretched and vile destitute and depraved that man really is and then he picks up with the gospel you get down to about chapter 3 and verse 23 and you read for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and then he doesn't stop there. The writing doesn't quiet. He didn't drop his pen and stop the letter. But he goes on to say being justified freely by his grace. And he goes on from chapter 4, that part of chapter 3, and into what we find in chapter 12. And he details for us uh, some of the most uh, deep doctrines of the Word of God. We find in these chapters the teaching on predestination, election, justification, sanctification and one day glorification if you want to know what the Lord Jesus has done for you in saving your wretched soul from hell, go pick up your Bible and read Romans chapter 1 and read those first 11 verses and Paul takes us on a journey from, from before time was until this very moment and reveals to us exactly what the Lord has done for us 
You know as well as I do, there are many in our day that they'll get up and all they'll emphasize is doctrine. They, they want to know about your soteriology or the doctrine of salvation. They want to know about your eschatology or the study of end times. They want to know about your ecclesiology or the doctrine of the church. They want to know if you're super or sublapsarian. I don't even know what that is, but I found it on Google, so I put it on my list. They want to know uh, what you are, where you stand, what you believe about this what you believe about that and don't misunderstand me that those things do have a place but on the other side you got guys like Todd White and if you don't know who he is don't waste your time googling him he is wrong just in case you was wondering uh, this whole lifestyle evangelism and this whole praying and seeing people healed and all this business that we find in our day uh, that isn't what the Bible teaches when it talks about spiritual gifts We've got both sides of the road, if you will. You've got the one side of the road that all they ever emphasize is doctrine and all they ever emphasize is having an intellectual understanding of who God is. And then on the other side, you hear statements like, we don't need doctrine, we don't need to understand, we don't need to know. All we got to do is live it in front of people and all we got to do is check off this box and check off that box and don't misunderstand me. We need doctrine and we ought to live right. What I submit to you tonight is this, that we ought to live in the middle of the road. And what we find in our text tonight is that the first 11 chapters of this book is Paul unfolding for us the great truths of the Word of God. And then from chapter 12 down through the close of this epistle, in chapter 16, you find him giving the practical application of what he just said. It goes something like this. Uh, he spends 11 chapters saying, you ought to believe this and this and this and this and this for 11 chapters. And then in chapter 12, he says, all right, boys, now it's time to know how this ought to affect how you live. I don't know about you, but I want to live a normal Christian life. And boy, we've got a lot of definitions of normal in this day, don't we? But I submit to you the only normal that you and I ought to be concerned with ought to be found in the pages of the Word of God. I submit to you tonight that a normal Christian life is this. It is one of self-denial and full submission to Jesus Christ. Jesus said it this way in Luke 9, 23. If any man come after me, let him take up his cross, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. He said in Luke 14, 26. If any man come to me and hate not father or mother or a, a, a husband or wife or sister, then he cannot be my disciple. Paul said it this way in our text. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Look at this phrase. Which is your reasonable service. You say, preacher, I've been living for Jesus for 25 years. I'm the faithful to church three times a week. I give to missions. I pay my tithe. I'm there on visitation day. And if you're not there and you want to be a part of visitation, start a visitation and be a part of visitation day. This is yes. This is no. You want to be a part of youth outreach? And, uh, you ain't got a youth outreach. Here's something real deep for you. Start a youth outreach. This is yes. This is no. Y'all all right? What I'm getting at this evening is there is more to serving the Lord Jesus than sitting on a pew, sitting in your spot, and attending service three times a week. A normal Christian life looks like this, or sounds like this, if you will. Not my will, but thine be done. Sounds something like this. Lord, whenever, wherever, whatever, no matter the cost, I will follow you. 
You've heard the story, and I don't want to reiterate it, but I will just cause I can. There, about 150 years ago, there was a revival that took place in uh, Wales, England, and as a result of that revival, there were missionaries sent out into some of the tribes in India, and this one missionary specifically went to this one uh, tribe. It was called the Assam tribe. If I'm saying it right, it, it was spelled A-S-S-A-M. If I ain't pronouncing it right, you can correct me later. But this tribe was known to be headhunters. This tribe was known as a vicious, barbaric people. And it was said that uh, they would kill people and they would hang the heads of their victims on the wall to display uh, their many victories and conquests. Well, God in His providence sends a missionary down there to preach the gospel. And He preaches and He preaches and He preaches. And He has one man, one wife, one woman, and their two children as His only converts the entire time that they are there. And news spreads to this tribe and this chief uh, that these people in His village are converting to this Jesus. And He goes and He tells that man, if you don't denounce your faith, uh, we'll kill you and your family. And that man penned the words that go something like this. Uh, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Uh, no turning back. Uh, and, the, and the chief said, well, if you don't denounce your faith, uh, we're going to kill your wife and your children. And the story goes uh, that those people killed his wife and his children. And it was the words of the song were recorded that though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. Uh, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, still I will follow. And the chorus so that song goes I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back uh, no turning back but don't you know that God wasn't done yet uh, that chief of that village heard that man and saw that man unwilling to deny his faith in Christ uh, and he said if that man is willing to see his family die and love this Jesus that much then I too must belong to Jesus and he was converted and he was saved and all the village was with him. We look at that and say, man, that's powerful. That's significant. No, I submit to you tonight, that is a normal Christian life. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. As we look at this text tonight, I want to point out two thoughts to you. I really only have two thoughts. But don't get excited. I got a bunch of little thoughts under them two thoughts. First of all, in verse 1, I'd have you to notice Paul's example. Paul's example. This is my water, right? This ain't his. I ain't trying to drink after him. <laughs> he says in verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. That word beseech, it means to call near, to invite, or to implore. Now, who in the world is this dude Paul and who does he is thinking he's going to tell me what to do? What kind of authority does he got to tell me anything? He says, I beseech you. Paul, I beseech you. You remember the Apostle Paul, don't you? We often know him uh, before God saved him as Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And the scripture says uh, in Acts 8 that he was at uh, the stoning of Stephen. And those men took their coats off and laid them at the foot of one whose name was Saul. We read in chapter 9, this same fellow Saul and a band of people with him, he gets on his donkey and he's journeying to Damascus. He's got letters from the high priest. He's got authority from the high priest to go kill, persecute, and imprison Christians. To go have his way. As he said, uh, the scripture says about him, he was breathing out threatenings and slaughters against all those that were of this way, is what he said. We know that he's journeying along uh, in sin, lost, uh, as he said it himself, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Uh, he was, as Jesus said, a whited sepulcher full of dead men's bones. And we know as he journeyed along that there came a day during that journey that the scripture says uh, that the Lord revealed himself to him as a light as bright as the noonday sun. And it says uh, that Paul fell, or that Saul fell down and said, 
Uh, and uh, Jesus said to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. And ain't it funny? Oh, Saul says, Well, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And what we didn't know, and he didn't know at that point, was that God had a plan that was being unfolded. What I'm getting at this evening is that Paul was radically saved. Paul was saved by divine grace. God, in his infinite mercy, had revealed himself to Paul, or Saul, at that time. Now, I ain't real smart, and I uh, don't claim to be a real good reader, but I don't find nowhere in there where old Saul went looking for God. I don't find nowhere in there where it happened. But what I do find is, a, is the God of heaven going to where Saul was. What I do find is that it was God that saved Saul. What I do find is that it was God that made Saul the apostle Paul and used him for his glory. What kind of authority does Paul got? Well, he was saved by grace. That don't do you. Well, Paul planted some churches. Planted churches in Macedonia. Planted churches in Galatia. He helped the church of Rome that we're reading about in Romans. And we could go on and on and on down the list. If that don't do you well, let me put it to you this way. Paul knew what it was to suffer for the cause of Christ and to live a normal Christian life. One of denying self and submitting to the Lordship of Christ.
place this time this morning. We good now? All right. There is an immediate application that must be made to you and to me. My question to you this evening, I've got several. My first question to you this evening is this. How are we to accomplish this normal Christian life? How are we to accomplish this life of self-denial and submission or surrender to the Lordship of Christ? Well, I'll tell you how. Paul tells us how. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, let you present your bodies a living sacrifice. The first thing that Paul points out in our personal experience is the mercy of God. The life of a believer is full of God's mercy. Mercy has been defined as not, uh, as not getting what we do deserve. Grace has been defined as getting what we don't deserve. And mercy has been defined as not getting what we do deserve. And newsflash, I don't mean to bust your bubble. I don't mean to hurt your feelings. But there ain't nothing good about you. They ain't nothing good about me. They ain't nothing good about you. And if you got what you deserved, you would be in hell. Don't matter if you're young or old, don't matter if you're black, white, green, yellow, tall, short, skinny, or round. If you got what you deserved, you would die under the judgment and wrath of Almighty God. What you and I failed to see, even before God saved us, was our life was marked by the mercy of God. Think about it with me now. Uh, you were lost in your sin. I don't know where you were. You may have been in the crack house or you may have been on a church pew. You, wherever you were doing whatever you was doing, whatever amount of debauchery, whatever sin you were involved in, uh, you were on your way to hell, a rebel against God, shaking your fist uh, in the face of Almighty God and glad about it. But God was merciful to you. He let you live. He let you breathe His air. He let your heart beat. He let your eyes work. He kept you alive and He sustained you. He's the one that brought you into this world. And He's the one that revealed Himself to you and saved you. One old feller said God was saving you before He saved you so He could save you. If you got what you deserved, you'd be in hell. From the word go, there wouldn't be no collect $200. No, there wouldn't be no redos. No, if you got what you deserved, you'd be in the judgment and wrath of God. But God was merciful. You didn't die in your sin. He didn't leave you to yourself. Oh, there's mercy even before you say there's mercy in your salvation. Sure enough, God kept you alive. God let you live and breathe even as a rebel against him. Oh, but aren't you glad there came a day when he revealed himself to you? Oh, you didn't go looking for him. No, it wasn't in you. It wasn't going to be. It couldn't be. You, you couldn't go looking for him because you wouldn't go looking for him. There wasn't no desire in you. That was a problem that they had with uh, that Jesus had in John 6. He said to them, the only reason you're following me is because you want bread, because you've seen the miracles. And he said, no man can come unto me. Why did he say that? He said, no man can come because no man would come. So what happened? What in the world happened to the Apostle Paul that made him turn from his life of rebellion and debauchery against the God of heaven and live his remaining days until he was killed for the cause of Christ serving Jesus because God revealed himself to him? What causes people to put down the needle what causes people to put down the bottle? What causes people to turn from a life of fornication and adultery and immorality and live a life that pleases God? Because God revealed himself to them. What causes people like Nicodemus that were raised up in a church pew and all they ever knew was the Word of God and the things of God? What causes them to turn from their religion and to turn from their uh, good works uh, and their own righteousness and trust Christ uh, and Christ alone? It's because God reveals Himself to them. I like what it says in Romans uh, 9, 15, and 16. We're looking at the word mercy or mercies. 
Same word in Romans 9, 15 where it says that uh, where the Lord said to Moses that he would have uh, compassion upon whom he would have compassion. And then he goes on to say, it's not of him nor willeth nor him that runneth, but God which showeth mercy. If there is ever going to be a sinner that is saved and there is ever going to be a wretched, vile, hopeless and helpless lost person given hope, somebody that's dead, made alive, somebody that's blind, given sight, deaf, given hearing, somebody made a new creature, it's going to be because God did it. Your life is consumed by mercy. You wasn't drowning in the ocean, struggling to survive. You were dead at the bottom. There wasn't no life in you. We could have went down to the car, to the, uh, to, the, to the morgue and pulled out your body and it would have said dead. Dead as a doornail. Dead as four o'clock. Whatever expression you want to use don't really matter. You was dead in your trespasses and your sins. You were spiritually alienated from God. But I'm glad the Bible says that we have been made nigh by the blood of His cross. I don't know about you, but I hadn't got over this evening that He come to where I was, that He sought me, because I wasn't seeking Him, but He sought me. I hadn't got over that He brought me from death to life, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of His dear Son. I ain't got over that I'm saved by grace on my way to heaven. I ain't glad about it. I I hadn't got over that there ain't a single sin laid to my account because the Bible says that he took the handwriting of the ordinances that were against us, nailed them to his cross, and we bear them no more. I like what the psalmist said. That he has separated us from our sin as far as the east is from the west. You say, preacher, that's a... That's a mighty good story. This Jesus fella coming into the world to save sinners. That's a good story. Who come up with that? God did. God did. What do you mean, preacher? Where did this whole story of redemption start? Did it start with you? No. Did it start with your grandma? No. Did it start with oh? Did it start with Noah? Surely it started with Noah. No. Did it start with Adam and Eve? Oh no, no. It started way back yonder for there was ever a mud ball called this earth or a star in its socket or a moon or a sun or a bird or a bee. There was a God in heaven uh, that had purposed uh, that Jesus Christ would come into the world and die for the sin of his people. I like what Peter said in Acts 2. It's by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God that Jesus Christ came in this world. You know what that means? There was a board meeting in heaven in eternity past and God the Father said, I got a people out of, out of, out of this fallen race I'm about to make and I'm going to redeem them. And then he said, oh, I know what the songwriter said. There was a search made over heaven. No, they wasn't. No, no. Jesus was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world, beloved. Jesus said, I'll go and I'll pay their sin debt. I'll pay their ransom. I'll redeem them from their sin. And the, and the Spirit said, wait a minute, hold up. They ain't going to come to you. They ain't going to have no desire for you. Let me go and I'll draw them unto you. I don't know if it went like that or not, but it sounded real good anyway. What I'm getting at this evening is you were saved because God was merciful. I ain't telling you to magnify your sin this evening. That ain't what I'm telling you. But you ought to go back sometime in your mind and remember the slop pit that God found you in. You ought to remember the muck and the mire that you was camping out in. And as the psalmist said, He lifted you up and He set you on a rock and He established your going and He put a new song in your heart. Even praise unto our God. You say, all right, preacher, so God's merciful before He saves us. God's merciful when He saved us. But I'm glad tonight that God's mercy doesn't just stop with salvation. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 says that His mercies are new every morning. That word mercy, it's compassion, pity. Oh, God could have left you to yourself. And He'd have went on being God. He'd have went on being just and righteous and holy. It wouldn't have affected His character one bit but he was merciful to you. A nobody, 
I ain't being rude when I say that. But you ain't nothing but a speck of dirt. And I ain't nothing but a speck of dirt. A bunch of nobodies from nowhere, whether it be the mountains of North Carolina or the inner city of Cincinnati. It don't matter. You's a nobody. I know I'm nobody. But God knew where you was. Hallelujah. And God knew uh, uh, your name and your frame. And God knew how well able how to get a hold of your heart and save you. And now, He calls you to live for Himself. How are we going to live this Christian life, preacher? By the mercies of God. We've seen the mercy in our experience, but secondly, I'd have you to notice the mandate. Since the microphone broke, I've added 20 minutes to my time limit to preach this evening. <laughs> Paul said, look, I, I, I am trying to hurry, I promise I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. This is the expectation that the Lord has for you, to offer your body a living sacrifice. This word body here, it's the Greek word summa. It literally means the entire thing. You've heard the story of the fellow that was flying on the jet plane and the storm came and, uh, the, st and uh, the plane began to go down and he began to pray and said, Lord, you can have me on Saturday, but i got to keep my Sundays for football. And the plane leveled out for a minute. And then the storm rose up again. And he said, Lord, you can have me on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But i got to have Sunday. And the storm rose up again. And before it was over, that feller done surrendered his whole life, every, every day of the week, to the Lord. And sure enough, the storm went away. I know that's an illustration, but you get the point. That the Lord wants every part of your life. He not only wants your works, but He wants your heart. Paul tells us exactly what our sacrifice ought to be, what it ought to look like, and all that. Look at it with me. I'll be brief. He said, I beseech your brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Our sacrifice must be living. That's real practical, ain't it? It's real deep. You ready? <laughs> You've got to be alive to live for God. That's real hard to get. But there's another aspect of this living sacrifice. It was a continual sacrifice. See, this church was made up of Jews and Gentiles. And you find that Paul is dealing with the reality that there's no difference in Christ between Jew and Gentile in this book. Amen? They would have understood what it meant to continually bring a sacrifice over and over and over and over again. It's interesting when Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then he says, And that it is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I don't mean to be crude when I say what I'm fixing to say, but getting saved and believing upon Jesus and trusting Him is not a one-night stand. It's not something you just do one time at an altar somewhere, you get your ticket punched and you're good to go. But the, the, at the moment in time when God reveals Himself to you and grants you saving faith, it is also a living faith. Sacrifice must be living, it must be continual. Well, look what he says. That you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Our sacrifice must be holy. In other words, it must be, it must be without blemish. It must be without blemish. Our sacrifice must be acceptable to God. My question to you this evening, I told you I had a few questions. What are you sacrificing to the Lord? Are you sacrificing the leftover time during the week after you've done all you're supposed to do? I know you've got to make a living. I know you've got to make money. I know you've got to take care of your family. I get all that. 
You almost understand what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that he ought to be preeminent in your life. What sacrifice does Jesus require of you? Your whole being. There's a lot of people. Did you hear what I said? He requires all of you. All of you. There's a lot of people that think that's just talking about preachers. All oh, that preacher, he's got to live, live like he's broke. He's got to eat sardines and saltine crackers. I don't even know if people eat that stuff. It smells like nasty and oil. <laughs> a lot of us are upset because we got to eat bologna instead of ribeyes. There's a lot of folk think that this whole living for Jesus business is for the Sunday school teacher. Amen. There's a lot of folk that think that this living for Jesus business is for the song leader. It's for the youth worker. It's for the, I don't know what y'all call them in the north, the offer and take her upper. <laughs> the usher. There it was. The usher. The offer and take her upper. I submit to you living for Jesus, being a Christian, is what God, what God expects and requires out of every one of his people. Many of us sacrifice ourselves on the altar of carelessness. We sacrifice ourselves on the altar of somebody else will do it. That ain't my job. I don't get paid for that. Can I, can I say this? Y'all gonna kick me out of here before this is over. There's more to serving God than preaching. There's more to serving God than teaching Sunday school. There's more to serving God than leading the youth. We're going to need some people up in here that are going to clean toilets. Amen. We're going to need people around here that's going to vacuum the floor. We're going to need people around here that are just going to be in their place. Amen. I still believe God requires faithfulness of his people. I ain't trying to rebuke you. I'm trying to challenge you. I'm trying to be realistic of where we are. If, they, if COVID-19 has done anything for any of us, it's proved the reality that ain't none of us as spiritual as we thought we was. Amen. Some of us sacrifice ourselves on the altar of compromise. You know, it's just a version of the Bible. It's just a song. It's just a dress standard. I still got a dress on, preacher. Y'all all right? <laughs> There's one old man said, if it ain't for sale, you ought not advertise it. That's just a good standard to live by. What I'm getting at tonight is this. We ought not sacrifice ourselves on the altar of carelessness. We ought not look at serving God as somebody else's responsibility. We ought not look at serving God with the mindset of compromise. Boy, I wish they'd get some better music in here. Boy, I wish they'd change the way this place looks. It looks like it's 25 years ago. We ought not live like the, like the Levite in Judges 18. You remember that story? The Levite leaves his home and he goes and he finds Micah and Micah says, you can be a priest unto me and I'll give you ten shekels, a shirt, and your food. And he serves the Lord with Micah as his priest until the Danites come and they offer him something better. And then he forsakes Micah, the ten shekels, the shirt, and the meal for whatever the Danites had. Beloved, you and I ought not sacrifice ourselves on the altar of something better. We ought not sacrifice ourselves on the altar of that's a bigger church down the road. They got a better preacher. They got a better youth program. It's happening down there. We ought not sacrifice ourselves on the altar of what can we do to reach people. Don't misunderstand me. I think we ought to do everything that we can do to reach people for the glory of God. But what is going to change the heart of a person isn't programs. 
What's going to change? What's going to change the heart of a person? It isn't going to be uh, mystical uh, things. It isn't going to be uh, uh, catchy phrases and slogans. It ain't going to be bouncy houses and slip and slides. It's going to be the gospel and the word of God. There ain't no political reform. There ain't nothing going to uh, fix uh, uh, the, the issues in our nation and around this world except the gospel. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What's that going to look like? And be not conformed to this world. Be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Preacher, what's the will of God for my life? To follow Jesus. I can't tell you where you're supposed to go to school. I can't tell you what you're supposed to do for a career. That's between you and God. But I can tell you this, that you ought to put God first. Your life ought not be about making money. You ought not be a preacher so-called or a teacher that you'd be in the limelight. You ought not quote-unquote serve God as a means to your end, but your end ought to be the glory of God in everything you do and everything I do, whether it be seen or unseen, ought to be done with the motive that God get all the glory. How are we going to live this Christian life? We're going to keep our minds on the mercies of God, past, present, future. As an act of worship, we're going to yield ourselves completely to the Lord. We're going to resist conformity to the world, whether it be thoughts or actions. We're going to focus on God's Word and fellowship with Him. This is a normal Christian life. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice unto God. Let me leave you with this. In 1890, a man named Judson Van Duten, if I'm saying it right, was an accomplished musician and worked as an art supervisor. It was said that he was helping to conduct an evangelistic meeting in East Palestine, Ohio, when he was faced with a crossroads. Continue an art career or surrender to preach the gospel. It was because of this crossroads and the determination that this man made that we now have this hymn. I'm going to read it for you. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence and daily live. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus. Take me now. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, holy Thine. Let me feel Thy Holy Spirit. Truly know that Thou art mine. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with thy love and power. Let thy blessing fall on me. And the chorus goes, I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. I submit to you tonight, you may not be a preacher. You may not be a teacher. You may not be a deacon. You may not be one of uh, reputation among the people of God at Wynton Place. But God still expects you as a born-again believer, to live a normal Christian life. And it is this, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Lord. Brother Danny, you come. Thank you. Go ahead, number.